You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Jim Green. Dr. Green has served as NASA's chief scientist since May 2018. Before that, he was the director of the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters. Under his leadership, several missions have been successfully executed, including the New Horizons spacecraft flyby of Pluto, the Messenger spacecraft to Mercury, the Juno spacecraft to Jupiter, the Grail spacecraft to the Moon, the Dawn spacecraft to Vesta and Ceres, and the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars. Dr. Green received his PhD in space physics from the University of Iowa in 1979 and began working in magnetospheric physics branch at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in 1980. In 1988, he received the Arthur S. Fleming Award for Outstanding Individual Performance in the federal government and was awarded Japan's Kotani Prize in 1996 in recognition for his international science data management activities. He also recently received the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal for the New Horizons flyby of the Pluto system. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. Now, Jim, Perseverance was one of those uh, rovers we landed with the Skycrane, and it has probably one of the coolest missions ever that NASA's ever done, at least in my book. And well, thank ingen- you. Ingenuity, ingenuity. <laughs> a, a Martian helicopter powered yeah. flight on Mars. Yeah. Now, when we last talked about this, it was it, it hadn't you know flown yet. Now it has, and were there any surprises about powered flight on Mars? Yeah, actually, to me there were several, and uh, you could probably ask the engineers, and there'd be uh, several others that I didn't even realize. Uh, the f- the first one is that uh, we can fly on Mars. It demonstrated that. Uh, building something that flies in a vacuum chamber uh, that has the same pressure and um, you know nearly the same temperature as the Mars atmosphere, that's fine, but that's not Mars. And you can only do so much in that area. So you know Mars has some dust in the atmosphere. It, it has temperature extremes. It has so many problems associated with it. I mean, the, the, the Ingenuity has the most advanced uh, uh, computer processor we've ever launched. It has more power than probably every processor you could put together that we've ever launched in planetary science. It could beat it out. Okay. And, and, and it's needed to do that because it does a lot of image processing. So we have a camera that looks forward and a camera that looks down and an altimeter. And those three pieces of information come in and the processing continues. So it's not a flight qualified computer. You know, it, uh, you know, it is uh, uh, nothing that would go on the, the, you know, the Europa mission, for instance. You know, it's the, you know that ain't going to happen. But um, uh, that was a worry. So how long is it going to last and would it really fly? And it, it, it clearly demonstrated that um, uh, the testing and everything they did at JPL uh, really made it happen. It was a, a marvelous, absolutely marvelous uh, feat of engineering. They really pulled it off. The next surprise is it's pretty delicate. It's four pounds. It's, you know, it's very, it's very light. Has to be because the it's like flying a helicopter here on Earth at 120,000 feet. No one has ever done that. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, but that's the temperature and pressure on the surface of Mars, and we did it. Well, how long is it going to last? Because we have all these off-the-shelf parts. And, and it's been fabulous. It has lasted through the five major test flights we hoped it would do. 
it's now completed flight 16. <laughs> so not only is it done the test flights, but now we're pressing it into service. So uh, many of these flights are absolutely spectacular. If you haven't, if you haven't seen some of them, they'll really, they'll really take your breath away. The ability for it to fly up, you know, with the down-looking camera, and then and then fly a pattern, stop in midair, turn 90 degrees, and then fly. Uh, straight to another point, a waypoint we call it, a turn and then fly again. And you can see that because the images are reorienting in, in, in view and, and it's just breathtaking. And then you see uh, the landscape and, and, and you see, you know, wow, hey, this didn't look so, you know, so dusty. And now we see, indeed, this is a place where we wouldn't want the rover to go because we're, we're not so sure uh, you could make it through these areas. Well, over here, we see all different types of of rock that's in the in the in the in the floor of the crater. I mean, you know, Yezero Crater has a floor, and that's where we're at, and we have to explore it, and that's what we're doing. And and if, and coming into that crater is indeed the uh, the delta, and that delta is you know uh, sixty five meters high in places. And so how, how, how are we going to, you know, approach this and how are we going to crawl up the, crawl up the delta? And so this scout, which is now Ingenuity, is, uh, is really doing a fantastic job. Total surprise. I mean, every day it's, it, it is a blessing that it's still working. And um, th those, it's just been one surprise after another. Added to the list, NASA's Mars <laughs> spacecraft that have long outlived their <laughs> original intended <laughs> surface time. <laughs> what, was, what was spirit and opportunity? I mean, like yeah, like, true. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, part of that is because we 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 didn't quite understand the Martian atmosphere. Okay, they, we we claimed okay, uh, how long is spirit and opportunity going to last? They're solar powered, and we know there's dust in the atmosphere. It settles out during the seasons, of certain seasons of the year, particularly um, in uh, Southern Hemisphere summer. It, Mars is in an, a highly elliptical orbit for which Southern Hemisphere summer, it's as close to the sun as ever. Okay, it, it, it ever is in its orbit. And so that has the tendency to kick up the dust and that dust can go global. And so that stuff gets pushed out, pushed around, it's really fine dust can settle out, and therefore it can it can it can uh, you know lay on top of the solar panels, uh, preventing the sunlight from getting through, depleting our battery. Then is going to get to the point where we can't operate it anymore. What is that? Well, ninety days. Boy, were we wrong. <laughs> we were we were wrong, and we were wrong because. We're finding the dynamics in the atmosphere to, uh, to be uh, much more of a surprise. Uh, we saw dust devils, the ability uh, sweeping events. Now, they're not just dust devils that sweep. Mars actually has a brisk wind. The wind can be as high as 125 miles per hour. Now, because the pressure is really low, that's not enough to straighten a flag on a flagpole sitting on the surface of Mars, okay? Even that, but the dust has a dynamics associated with it. If you pick up this dust, you, you it, it then has a trajectory, it goes up and comes down and it hits other dust particles, they fly off, okay? So the concept that the dust actually, uh, uh, one particle then uh, jumps around flying other particles off, which then fly up uh, and impact uh, uh, other particles as they come down. And that creates a sweeping event. All you have to do is just pick up the lightest dust and the wind will do that. And so just, you know, those kind of dynamics, we just didn't understand because we hadn't been there that way. To shift gears really quickly, but not too far, perseverance. And, you know, what has Percy discovered? What have we learned so far in a nutshell? Okay. Well, Percy is all about finding areas for which we're going to create samples. 
the heart of the mission is a rock core. This is a cylindrical saw, if you will, that um, will will spin and uh, chew up a rock, creating a view, beautiful cylinder of, um, of rock uh, uh, of a sample. And it looks like a piece of chalk, piece of chalkboard chalk. Now, for those that are listening, and there's probably quite a few that don't know what a piece of chalkboard chalk is because they've never used it, I, I will tell you that it's it, it's like a large Crayola crayon, okay? And once you create that, you then put it in a, a sleeve, a metal sleeve, titanium, uh, and then seal it. And then we're gonna hang on to these. Now, right now we've actually done five samples. We've done four rock boring uh, examples and an atmospheric one. The atmospheric one is just as important as the rock samples because you know what we're finding out in the atmosphere of Mars is methane. You know, Perseverance measures methane. Every time it takes an atmospheric sample, Perseverance sees the methane. It's above the background. Now, during certain times, it sees a lot more above the background than at other times, but it's it seems to always be there and it seems to be leaking through the surface. Perhaps it's doing that also in the area where uh, perseverance is. So we want a sample. We want you know we want to look at the that uh, all the trace gases, uh, every everything in it, and the best way to do that is bring that sample home. So. Those five samples were carefully created. Uh, we also recognize that uh, on this crater floor, there's a, a lot of basaltic material. Now that means there's a nearby volcano. That means either that stuff came down in the river or it was blown into the crater area, okay? Um, we also see a lot of the stratigraphy now of how the delta has been built up. Now, this is also going to be really exciting because when we get on top of the delta, we also have a you know this ground penetrating radar. I'm hoping that, and it will go down uh, 65 meters, so it, it can take a good look at the buildup of material over time in this delta. And it may tell us, if we can actually tease out stratigraphy, that there are certain times or conditions on Mars where there was more flow into the crater than at other times, bringing more sediments to us, creating thicker layers. And maybe that's periodic, and maybe that's tied to other climatic features on Mars that we are, you know, the history of the climate on Mars, we really have only vague ideas as to what's going on. So, so there's the, the promise of some really spectacular measurements uh, in, in that area also. So um, uh, it, 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 uh, they're so excited about the area that we're in. They're, we're going to be in this area now for probably several more months before we uh, turn our attention and start trekking up the, up the hill and up this um, uh, you know, delta that has been built up over you know, tens of millions of years. Now, another recent mission launch was DART. And could you tell us, give us an overview of what DART's going to do and why this is of such great importance to the future of Earth? Yeah. So DART is uh, very simply our first planetary defense demonstration mission. All right. Um, what, ha what happened about 20 or so years ago is... Um, we began to recognize that we're not in a very good orbit. We see these near-Earth objects all the time crossing our orbit. They're, they're, they're material that's come out of the asteroid belt. They're actually being thrown out of the asteroid belt by Jupiter, and some of them even by Mars. And, and when those gravitational resonances occur from those poles of that huge planet Jupiter, you know, which is 300 times the mass of our own Earth, it throws things either out of the solar system or inward. And we now estimate, today we can estimate the number of objects we need to be finding and tracking on a regular basis that cross our orbit or come near enough to us that will 
we can attract and it will hit us. And there's about 60,000 of them, 60,000 of them, okay? Now those things are crossing our orbit. It's gonna hit the earth. It's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. And there's many of them that are huge. Now the crater uh, in um, the Yucatan Peninsula that uh, you know caused the extinction of the dinosaur, we can estimate the size of that object as to be about six kilometers. So the large ones these uh, of these objects range up to 33 kilometers. There's one out there that's 33 kilometers big. I mean, talk about a planetary extinction event that crosses our orbit and if that ever hits us and as i said it it, it will because it does cross our orbit that'll be a bad day so we better figure out how to defend this planet and that's what dart's all about now dart's an acronym it's a double asteroid redirect test and the name sounds sounds kind of goofy but you'll understand it when i tell you we're not just going to hit an asteroid that's orbiting the sun and watch it move. We're going to hit the moon of an asteroid. And so there are double asteroids out there. Uh, in other words, uh, where one asteroid, a smaller one, is orbiting the larger one. Okay. And we felt that that was the right thing to do. If we hit a, a, a single asteroid, and move it, we may have, and we don't know how much it's gonna move, we can only estimate it, we've never done this before, but if we move it in a way that it then it becomes hazardous and hits the earth on the next orbit, that would kind of defeat the purpose. <laughs> and so, but if we hit the moon of a double asteroid and we can see how that orbit changes around the main asteroid, then, then we really understand uh, that uh, what we can do to defend the planet. And, and so we're going to an asteroid called Didymos. It's about 800 meters in size, you know, pretty big, uh, you know, nearly a planet killer, all right? And it has a moon, and the moon is uh, dimorphous, uh, which is about 160 meters. That's the moon of the double asteroid we're going to hit. So we're going to hit Dimorphos, and Dart's going to do that, and it, it's a test, and we want to watch it move. Now, we know when that's going to happen, because Dart got launched, and um, at the end of September or early October, when um, uh, Didymos is flying close to the Earth, we're going to hit it. So we're going to be able from Earth to make a whole variety of measurements to see how that moon's orbit changes after that impact. And that's called a kinetic impactor. That's a technique uh, that we believe will work uh, over a whole range of asteroid sizes. And uh, we'll, we'll know exactly how well it will work uh, at the end of this test. So it's coming up, you know, September uh, 2022 is uh, just right around the corner. Now, I, one thing that I, I noticed, there's a, a number of questions on Patreon that, that sort of bring us back to James Webb. The James Webb Space Telescope and techno signatures. Now, first of all, what can it offer us as far as searching for techno signatures? But the second is, do we have the dynamics to turn that telescope towards, you know, transient object like uh, tabby star or something like that if it goes into a major dip or something like that can we swing it around and take a look just like we've done with you know other instrumentation that's a good question web web is uh, really all about looking at um, uh, infrared uh, looking at objects in the infrared and indeed uh, objects with atmospheres uh, radiate really well in the infrared and all kinds of material uh, can be seen. Uh, the problem is the planets we'd like to see are probably really close to the stars. And therefore we can see, we have to have a strong signal uh, that has to be close to us. It has to be far enough from uh, the sun, uh, their, their sun that we then can uh, make that observation. 
So it, it, the, the ability to find the right object uh, hasn't come to fruition yet to where I can say, you know, we're now going to look at a Earth-sized planet's atmosphere. It's just perfect for us. We, have, we haven't found that object now, there are plenty of other objects we want to look at, much larger planets, probably Jupiter-sized planets, that are in the range that we can get to, that, that uh, Webb will do perfect, and, and that will be an important uh, first step. And, we'll, uh, and of course, it'll tell us a lot about how well that whole technique works. And not only that, I mean, if, if you're looking at things like hot Jupiters and trying to characterize the atmosphere of these giant planets, we're probably going to see some very strange <laughs> things, unlike our solar system as far as atmospheres and how they behave, right? Yeah, right. So where, where are we getting the list? Well, TESS is helping us. So TESS is looking at bright stars that have planets. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, a test is a, tra a transit observation, you know, so a planet moves in front of the star, we see the light dim. And so that's great. Bright stars are typically closer to us, you know, they're close stars. Um, uh, they're either hotter than most stars or they're, they're closer. That's why they're brighter. And so consequently, uh, that's a great, that's a great list. Uh, and, and so uh, um, we're going to be leveraging what we find out from tests a lot. Now, my last question for you, Jim, for today is you also wrote a relatively recent paper about the idea of creating a magnetic shield to um, place in, in between the sun and Mars that could serve as a kind of artificial magnetosphere to protect that planet and maybe start changing the makeup of its atmosphere. Is that still on the table, that idea of, of artificial magnetospheres? Yeah, I like the idea. I like the idea of um, these, these papers that look well ahead to, uh, to be able to see how to create uh, more habitable environments for us on planets. And the idea of a magnetosphere is to block the solar wind. Now, you can't block it completely. And magnetospheres uh, uh, have uh, uh, opportunities uh, to uh, even enhance some, at, at sometimes outflows from planets. But if, you, but if you get this right, here's what we'd like to see. Mars currently does not have a magnetic field. In the solar wind, then, we, we measure from MAVEN, we see it uh, stripping oxygen, which uh, we believe is being disassociated probably largely from water, because there's a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere. And then, uh, you know, once you get the hydrogen and the oxygen disassociated, then, and the oxygen is high enough in the atmosphere, then it ends up in the ionosphere and gets stripped. That ain't coming back. So that's how you deplete the ocean in the atmosphere over time is from stripping. We believe that's been one of the dominant mechanisms for losing the atmosphere. So when we think about what's being stripped on a constant basis and we're on the surface of the planet and we measure a constant pressure, then it has come to an equilibrium. Mars is still cooling off from when it was made and so it's constantly outgassing. And the outgassing then is increasing the pressure, but the stripping is decreasing the pressure. And so therefore it's come to an equilibrium. Now, if you stop the stripping, then Mars itself will increase in surface pressure. Pressure is related to temperature. And so the temperature will go up. So then the concept is by creating a magnetic field can you begin the process of having Mars itself uh, create a, a, a more, more um, friendly environment for humans to be able to live and work on the surface? Now, uh, we're writing a, a, actually a two, paper, two papers in this series. The first paper on, on, on the magnetosphere configurations, etc., has been published now. And um, uh, the second paper I hope to uh, to to get submitted um, in the next couple months. Now, Jim, um, everybody should check out your podcast, Gravity Assist. Where can they find it? Ah, 
So if you do uh, www.nasa.gov slash gravity assist, you'll be right at the top page. Uh, and and um, I now have um, uh, nearly done with my fifth season. I'm starting to work with my producers uh, that helped me so much make that such a, a, a wonderful, a wonderful and fun thing to do. Uh, and I hope everyone is enjoying it. Uh, we're talking about what that next season will be like. And uh, the last one we posted was with uh, Martin Weisskopf, who is the PI of a fabulous mission that was just launched called XP. So I hope you uh, take the time to listen in. All right, Jim, thanks for joining us today. And I hope you'll come back for more updates as all of the enormous amount of cool stuff that's going on at NASA unfolds this year. Oh, my, my pleasure. Thanks so much for asking me. I had a wonderful time. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. And be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What?